mm -hmm. in terms of supporting the synthesis process. Mm -hmm. um, so coming to it fresh, we can just flag issues that we um, think are going to assist that synthesis. I think it's just having had a glance at the India paper, but that's late arrival, but not having seen it. I think these two sessions are actually really interesting and complementary. Um, you know, the commonalities around formal you know, legal rights of women and yet this incredible alienation, um, high levels of femicide in, 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 in India, very high levels of domestic violence and um, corrective rape and various things in, in South Africa. So people really not feeling that um, social contract and the protection of the state that we were speaking about yesterday. And I'm sure that will come through the synthesis as well. So, um, Desiree, would you keep us up for that then? It's a, this is a bit challenging because um, I wasn't actually, we weren't really prepared to present findings, more to kind of talk about the project, that's what we understand. So, I'm going to be a bit disconnected and see how it goes. Um, well, I think you, you, you realize that the project focused on students teaming up with women in communities. Well. And we thought of it as a kind of an each one, each one situation. Um, I just want to say something first of all about the context, and then I'll say something about our approaches, <coughs> and then say something about the impact. Just in terms of South Africa's ICT landscape, and obviously many people here who work on South Africa in terms of ICTs would, would know this. Um, I think it's worth noting that South Africa immediately after, with the democratizing process, um, really took up the challenge of integrating government's uh, public participatory projects with radical telecommunications reform. It really now shows that South Africa has a sub-optimal uh, ICT policy and regulatory environment. Um, there's been lack of policy implementation. Um, departments have been in disarray, ministers have changed, and there's very little government regulation. So it's interesting that to a great extent that many other African countries, South Africa's really got a glaring first world, first third world divide in terms of uh, ICTs. So you see drop the internet is extremely limited for the majority, um, including young women, uh, including young people in urban and peri-urban centers and often very close to sources of power. Um, so while this suggests a very bleak scenario for ICT reform, South Africa does have a policy-rich environment. And recently, there's, um, I don't know if anybody knows about the national, and I'm speaking specifically to South Africa now, national ICT policy framework, which has just been introduced. And that seems to be offering the possibility of mainstreaming ICTs into broader public participatory processes. And I think it's important to think about that being an area where we can push for policy recommendations. The second set of points in terms of co uh, context has to do with local government and public participation measures. There was tremendous enthusiasm and optimism after 1994 about local government being the level of government that's closest to the people and that would really involve women. But more recently, um, public participation, the notion of public participation in South Africa has become more and more hazy and increasingly symbolic. And I think especially for young people, the idea of local government or any level of government is, um, is actually, there's there something very alienating for many young people about <coughs> local government. And we found this in the, um, the baseline study that we did. Um, very often also the information that's produced by NGOs and by local government is extremely condescending and doesn't speak to the sort of energies and the, the feel of young people living in a rapidly transforming uh, world. So um, all this makes local government and information about it seem quite repressive and authoritarian. This is something we picked up in the data analysis questionnaires and focus group discussions. Um, yeah, so many young women experience local government of existing information about it, it's sterile, cold, abstract, very disconnected from the embodied experiences as young, classed, gendered, and sexualized subjects. So it's this recognition of alienation that led us as co uh, coordinators of the project 
to avoid the very familiar gender mainstreaming approaches to public participation. In other words, simply making sure that the young people were included, because it was precisely that inclusion that they were so uncomfortable about. Um, and to think, to embrace some quite radical feminist ideas about what constitutes women's citizenship and public participation. Um, so just turning to frame a kind of political and theoretical framework that we use. As the project evolved, the meanings of public participation and active citizenship became just more and more complex. And often it was kind of up and down because it's not as if there was always this kind of desire and embrace for a radical feminist notion. There was an unevenness in young women's consciousness. And that's that links up with the presentation that I made yesterday. It's kind of deep liberal aspiration. Um, this need to be empowered in very individualistic terms that constantly surfaces. And it was quite a challenge to think about creating a collective that was not sort of repressive and regulatory and saying, well, this is not how you should think. think. Um, some people are frowning. I hope I'm making sense. Because as I say, I'm making Um, what we ended up working with quite heavily is the distinction between what one critic calls invited as opposed to invented spaces of citizenship. So invited spaces of citizenship are of course those spaces that are available to the rights and so on. Invented is something that's crafted very much by subjects themselves. Um, I don't think I'll say too much about the approaches because I think it comes through fairly clearly there. But I, feel, I mean, our participatory action research methods involve being guided and led by young women themselves. And very often there was an attempt to combine what was celebratory with what was informative. So some of the events that you saw there, which were public events, some were on campus, some were off campus in community spaces involved panel discussions, but they also involved activities like dance. Another form that was quite useful was the installation. And what became really clear to us, I think there's an assumption that young people need to be introduced to ICTs. But traditional media continues to be hugely important. So for example, performance, hip hop, um, to actually be in a space and be with, sharing with people. Um, so I think that the, the importance of hybridized and mixed technologies, even in urban spaces, because I think the assumption is that it's only in rural spaces that one needs to do this kind of mixing because people have quite embraced um, elaborate technologies enough. Um, how much time do I have? I have another 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I won't do all, all that. But I think what I want to do is just talk about the um, our findings, which we have not written up extensively, so people who've got the receipt tape will receive a very weird uh, conclusion. I think we, we won't know. Yeah. Okay. So that is a very brief section, but we've um, divided that into a discussion of informational power, associational power, and, and collective action. But just in turning to informational power, um, I refer to the invented spaces of citizenship that young women are creating through ICTs. Um, and I think what has become clear is that the existing information and media landscape really does provide young people with fertile resources to be able to create, um, create forms that speak about their interests. So for example, something like the installation, where they put together and juxtapose um, different kinds of objects or images. Um, yeah, for me that was that was really um, very powerful. And I think it's, it, it speaks also to the importance of thinking about how people imagine. And I think very often the, the, the role of imagining and creativity is left out of our thinking when we talk about political activism, especially right now. I think that's something that we've been learning constantly, that without that, we just don't develop project or a, vision, a political vision that really speaks to people's deep sense of, of where they want to be and who they are. Um, one of the things that was shown in this video is something that we came to call a digital activist message, a dam, as it called it, um, which is a short, a very short documentary 
which combines provocative images and text. So one, one related to Trump bodily integrity and violence, one related to transport, yeah. and one related to unemployment. And these can be, um, so there's a great deal of excitement in using them. But I think what they also revealed is that young people are not keen to have a kind of long explanation of this is what violence is all about. There needs to be space to interpret and draw conclusions. So these are really very important and useful conscientizing tools. They can be used by NGOs, they can be used to promote discussion. And the young women that we were working with all have sort of really strong leadership positions in the sense that they've worked with others. So some of them have gone to these schools and, so on, and have used uh, these digital items in those ways. Um, collective action. This was uh, for me a challenging one um, because yeah, I think in terms of thinking about collective action, what we realized is that our measures of action sometimes can be very rigid and two-dimensional. Um, and I think that, that becomes clear when you think about the impact that, how difficult it is to measure the impact of a particularly powerful dance. So the dance that you saw, I don't know if you remember the young woman in the art, her dance was in relation to trying to get young people to think about valuing their bodies. Now the usual message about violence and bodily integrity, certainly in South Africa for black women, is a message of gloom and doom. You see battered women who look absolutely defeated, absolutely victimized, and you know, I think young women are really just saturated and overwhelmed by that very bleak image. So this was another way, and it was very interesting how people responded to that dance. She did this herself. And again, this is the kind of thing that could be circulated and used in place of the sort of digital storytelling that simply retells the story of women's victimization. Mm. And I think I'm going to stop there because I'm... Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Do you, do you want to add anything? Um, Kathleen, would you like to... Let me go first. So I'll respond to this as a, a work of in progress, if that's what you're saying, because I think the findings will still and soon come out um, bit more, but I saw like the description was going one way and it was kind of incomplete in the, in the findings, so I'll just um, respond as to what I um, what I read. Um, well, my own background was, um, you know, I became aware of the project at ICTD uh, 2012 in Atlanta when Anita filled me um, briefly in on this new three country partnership. Just had a, a few brief moments to hear, okay, now there's this partnership uh, coming up very fast, uh, pretty soon, and then 18 months later, um, I had the opportunity to meet the team um, at ICTD 2013 in Cape Town, and where the team briefly um, attended the pre-conference and then participated in the ICTD um, 2013 conference um, in Cape Town, and um, they had their stand at the local showcase, and I also attended the journal launch of um, Feminist Africa, um, issue 18. And um, if there's anything that one should be reading at the moment is to read at least this article or see that issue because it's fabulous. Um, it's a great, this um, report is a great follow-up from that um, journal article. <coughs> and in the article, there's like a, a line by Intabelli um, who observed that it is often through rediscovering the ordinary and the everyday that some of the most uh, penetrating insights into the, into the political emerge. And um, I think it's also this like opportune moment that our um, network inclusion roundtable um, has just, I think, will make this project even richer. Um, because it, it started to make me think of, um, you know, the last three days of how, um, I think yesterday a few days, um, Sean, like brought up the idea of like this process of activation prior to mobilization. 
where you know you're, you're activated. You know, young people are getting activated. It may seem frivolous. We're looking at LOL cats. We may be just looking at our Facebook pages. But it could be the basis of a larger, you know, civic action in the future, like just a build up that we, we just don't know about. Um, so it's also reinterpreting the local, and this is um, part of your report, like reinterpreting the local, bringing the lens of power analysis to these emergent patterns that we might not be aware of. And in the case of, of young women in this story, like the, it's this mix of creativity to activism, um, feminism, civic action, you know, creativity leading to the imagination of future possibilities. Um, actually, um, Jenny from um, APC uh, gave me, a, like I still remember from 2008, her telling me, you know, the best artists are activists, so, or the best activists are artists, maybe one way or the other. So, I mean, the, the example of the determination of creating a logo for Act ITFM, the artist showcase, which we just saw, creating documentaries have been great examples of working towards participation, that creativity, that maybe activation that needs to take place before that social mobilization happens. And building that ability to have, um, uh, to do social change, the space for critical voices, to experience, to express your experience and political issues has, I think, started in this like lovely groundwork that, that I'm um, now seeing within this project. Um, Yes, the, the project has had a limited time frame for engaging um, into the next level, which I think was like enhancing public participation, uh, communal visibility of the young women. But I wouldn't tr want to try to rush this project at all. I mean, clearly it has to take you know these um, very deep stages of you know realization and understanding um, and perhaps uh, conscientization um, before you lead up to um, you know civic action and. And I think you also mentioned that it could lead to like wider national and global contexts that you know conveyed from you know commentary of global politics. Uh, we still don't know, but overall the report is a really good summary of a lot of South African history and women's agency within the government processes, um, along with um, ICT literature and and feminist theorists um, theory. Um, you did mention the the new ICT policy in South Africa and. I think, well, Allison's been involved in like the broadband strategy, and now um, we really do start to see in that broadband strategy like the demand component that you know um, human capabilities now being part of that kind of you know framework ecosystem framework and improving the capabilities of, of citizens. So that might be a suggestion to kind of update that that there is like this um, movement towards that. Um, but nevertheless, you know, women having to take up skills to fulfill a possible status quo, we still need to be aware of that. Um, that, um, you know, yes, it is, I mean, I'm also quite disconnected with, you know, just going through my, um, my comments, but uh, like citizen involvement in South Africa, there's clearly been a history of youth um, being involved in the past, um, struggles for democratic citizenship under apartheid, and the ongoing struggles today. Um, is clear for citizenship in the present. Um, in the video, there was the one woman who was had the understanding that you know their parents had fought against segregation of the past, and that this woman was quite aware of those struggles. So my question came to me like, well, you know, what are the passing on of the tools of citizenship? Did that happen? Uh, you know, there's in, in the paper it talks about erosion of the bottom-up process. Um, you know. Uh, which I think also has come out from the workshop. Um, you know, yesterday in the panel, you know, there's the general weakening of mass, you know, democracy um, that was referred to, and uh, you know, in South Africa itself, it has you know the largest number of recorded you know social protests in the world. And so yes, there's this also discussion of you know the sense of restlessness amongst youth, but at the same time, you know, familiarization of, of modern um, technology, and. Um, but I think the, the idea of just restlessness and non-participation, I mean, um, I think there could be a suggestion of like update because now post-election, we have the economic freedom fighters. I know that Julius Malema is not a youth, but you know, considers himself as a, a representation of young people. And there are a lot of young people, like on my campus at least for sure, I don't know about UWC that you know, um, are following down that, that line and, um, you know, through the student uh, representative council, which are very powerful in each university, they now have representation and are fighting for the, 
you know, the values of the rights of workers, of disenfranchised, um, they're recruiting, you know, actively. They felt powerlessness within the Youth League of the, the African National Congress. So I think maybe some suggestion of like, you know, what, you know, there's this restlessness amongst, you know, some disenfranchised youth, clearly, but then there's also this other youth movement that are, that's taking, you know, <laughs> a lot of power. You know, you watch, people are watching the parliament more than ever, you know, because of this, you know, not dressing for decorum at the parliament, you know, wearing, red worker suits to, you know, be the obvious, um, you know, uh, worker representation. So I think maybe some kind of commentary on that may be, um, may be of interest, particularly talking about youth. Um, I know, I saw it, it was in the art, in your Feminist um, Africa yeah. article very briefly, and you mentioned, like, he does not represent youth, but I don't know if it, yeah, it is something to think about, because this is now, you know, something that's coming, at least I know a lot of students are talking about the, the EFF in, in a lot more publicly than before the election, um, so. Um, and then when you spoke about, you know, uh, I think this might be then the reimagining of the future, that um, marginalized women speaking up within local government or to local government, that there's this, that uncomfortableness of speaking within this type of public, um, so I know, like, you know, I'm more familiar with like some of the workers' rights, like the example of informal street traders um, who have, like, in my own community, you know, continuous dialogue with the ethnic community, um, local municipality. I mean, it has gone so far as you know, breakdown of dialogue. You know, they've taken them to the lawyers. They tried to take their space away for informal traders to trade within like one of the largest trading um, areas in Durban. Um, you know, we're working with, you know, the NGO South Durban Alliance on climate change and I know that they have their own protocols of reaching their local councillors to get their voice heard in the local papers. So I'm just trying to understand what are those reimagining of how uh, young women in, um, in your cases that you've been working with, um, you know, I'm still uncertain, like, what is to be imagined as that possible engagement with, you know, that local governance, um, like what are those kind of hy hy hypotheses or ideas? Like which which departments do you I, I, uh, do you hope to target? Like I know you've talked about issues of transport, and unemployment, and violence, bodily integrity as being some of the main focuses. I'm still not <coughs> sure like how you know are are there going to be like I know you don't want to direct uh, you know the particular women like this is you know if you're going to attack unemployment then you know do it this way. But I'm still kind of trying to agree imagine what could be those possibilities for them to speak out and say we're you know we're tired of this <laughs> so um, and then lastly um, there's the discussion of commodity um, uh, in your quote like teenage girls and young women have been persuaded that they can and should improve themselves in terms of their bodily image their social aspiration and it's a notion of possibility of envisioned self that is currently core to their ascribed um, subjectivities um, I think in the last, again, the last few days, I keep referring back to the uh, round table because it has been enriching for me to um, better uh, understand the paper, is that whole idea of like personhood, self-determination, to be the person that you want to be, um, and uh, you know, that was also coming out, and um, yeah, I don't know, I just have this one, <laughs> like one of our master's students is doing one on hair and hair, you know, products, and you know, uh, and, and you know how women feel like have to like project themselves in a certain way. I don't know. I I, I left it that I don't know where I was going with that point, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, can you give us some tips, and then we'll try and open it up for a few minutes. Um, and I don't have as much as Kathy does. I just have a few questions that came to mind. Um, when I read the report, and I don't know, I don't know a little bit about the context that you're working in, but uh, I thought I'd comment more from, a, from having worked on a lot of young women projects and having worked on a lot in uh, politics, uh, the s small p politics um, at home. Um, so I think, first I think it's a wonderful project, and I think it's very touching to watch these expressions, and I recognize that um, I don't know if there's any other way or method in life to start um, to start this reclaiming 
of bodies than what you've been doing. Like it is the way to do it. And um, and I know that uh, for young women, especially you know, college level students, this is very important for them and very moving and will have a very long term impact. Um, I think the point, so the, the most interesting point um, you, you put up is um, this challenge that you didn't want to make this about liberal empowerment, yeah, about one woman um, facing a, a challenge, but rather how to take it into the collective and how to make it respond to the three issues that you put out, which are very, com very connected issues. Yeah? So you need transportation to get to your employment, and you don't want to face violence along the way. So it's a very sort of intimately, intimately connected subject. Um, what I feel happens, and it just flags that I want to put up there in terms of working on politics in women. Again, the small key politics, yeah? So the real politique, not the politics of, of feminism. I think there's a huge gap that we always misread um, because we imagine that um, we we imagine that the there's processes um, that are easy and democratic and um, and if we are strong enough to take issues of violence to these spaces, we will know what to do with them, which is. I don't know if I'm being articulate, but I've, I've noticed a lot of the times that when we sit together as feminists and we talk about such intimate things like our bodies and the violence against us and how we're racialized and how we're genderized, etc., we develop such complicated yet understandable code among each other. Yeah? So someone has to say one thing and we all go like, yes, you know, there's this connection. And then we try to translate that to the bus conductor and it becomes very difficult. Yeah, because they want to know in one sentence, which is what happens in, in to trans people all the time, where we go through intense thinking about our bodies and our genders, and then we meet a doctor and they ask you, why do you want to do this? And you have to answer in one line, because he needs to like, fill it in. So just to say, um, I wonder about the translation of these complex terms that challenge patriarchy into tools that young women can actually use Directly and local government. Second thing that came to mind is um, I've seen a lot of projects in the in the Arab countries. Recently, women uh, women's rights has become extremely mainstreamly popular, which is horrible. Um, you know, there's all these projects and funding, especially about women in politics, because we have the lowest rates in the world of women actually in government. And so I started working with a lot of these projects a few years ago. And then um, we also realized along the way, as more women were gaining more access to run for office, for mayor, for municipality, for parliament. I have a friend who's running for president. And all these wonderful things. In, in feminist, in the name of feminism, sort of, um, we, we noticed down the line that we've forgotten we had forgotten um, economy, which is also where I feel this EFF people became really popular, yeah? Because they brought back economy. They, for, they foregrounded the economy. I think also the, when we look at fe feminism and analysis, which we always like to do from the violence, we start with violence a lot, yeah? We start with bodily integrity and personal, and et cetera. And then we try to enter the realm of politics, and then there you have these major splits in terms of econo economic theory, which I don't feel we do enough. Also not sure if that makes any sense or is useful at all, but it's also an experience that we, we felt through. So at the end we had, you know, we found ourselves with very right-wing feminists who were all about violence and sexuality and preventing rape and all of these issues, but because there wasn't enough of discussion um, about all the other stuff, yeah, economy, migration, that we sort of assume, because I sort of assumed if you're a feminist, you're a leftist, right? If you're a feminist, you're medical. You can't be a feminist and be, I don't know, mm -hmm. pro something. Classes. Mm -hmm. Yes, or reformist. Yeah, no feminists are reformists. The words don't go together for me, but these were also assumptions that we made. 
So we had all these people with wonderful discourses on violence, but couldn't connect violence to capital or to immigration or to civil war or to sectarianism. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, these are the things I wanted to um, to highlight. So I'm just curious about in, in this project what happens next to this group. What's this group going to do? Are you hoping that you sort of because they're community leaders, they can then go on and do things or <laughs> okay, I think we'll, um, we'll obviously get responses when we, before we go around. Um, I also did want to just make a few points and got some of the um, uh, sort of other insights into this particular area and into the project. And I just think without diminishing the, the sort of very rich um, uh, expression of the problems as you've shown them and you know to really allow these women's voices to speak for themselves etc i think from a um, research perspective it would be useful to background and as, as i say i really want to foreground this but i think from a research perspective it would be useful to background some of the existing information we do have about um access use trends um alienation, etc., from quantitative to qualitative um, workers out there. Um, and I think the Western Cape, and particularly these townships, are, are really, really interesting. Um, I mean, just purely, purely from, a, from a, uh, the quantitative side of the work, um, basically women in the Western Cape, from a pure descriptive point of view, from having access to phones and mobile phones, were equal, equal and in some cases greater users of um, particularly things like Mixit, very um, low cost um, social networking application, etc. Um, and then uh, also basically because of the demand constraints of affordability, using these networks, including Facebook Zero, mm -hmm. primarily to communicate to their very, very localized. So that although they may be on the World Wide Web, they're actually talking to their family and friends mm -hmm. who they would be speaking to if they weren't using you know, that, that network. Um, but then some examples of these possibilities where people have had enough money to post stuff on YouTube that has had caught on and that sort of thing. So I think there is, you know, there are, there is that um, interesting potential. But certainly, you know, it is, it is Facebook zero. In fact, it makes its cost um, uh, that's really driving um, um, take up of the services. Um, but then the focus groups around it, because we were all, you know, like, oh, unlike the rest of Africa, we've got these e equity, at least, in the um, access issues. We actually, actually participated in some of these focus groups in um, Nyanga and um, uh, Galicia in, in um, Cape Town. And what was interesting in those was that um, the women were actually very active politically. The women were the leaders. The men were actually not, not the leaders in those communities. And it's particularly Western Cape... Um, a yeah, very strong Western Cape um, phenomenon. We don't find it in rural areas of KwaZulu-Natal where we did those focus groups, for example. So they have this very strong voice. And it's obviously not all women, but a lot of the men were unemployed. A lot more of the women in these groups were actually employed. They were far more kind of proactive and whatever. So I just wanted to sort of, again, to, to highlight the um, sort of contradictions and the tensions and the um, you know the complexities of these of these relationships, and I think to, to pick some of those up because I think there are um, opportunities for um, uh, collective action that may not necessarily around particular issues um, have to be um, women centred. Although obviously you want to keep them women led and whatever, but I just think there are there is something there. So I just in terms of your um, conceptualization of. Um, the research method, I mean, I think these are lovely terms because they're so alien to our traditional research methods. When I say traditional, I'm talking about sort of, you know, <coughs> um, peer-reviewed. But you said, you know, celebratory, reformatory um, uh, um, research methods. And then I thought, which, again, picking up what we discussed the last few days, what, what takes that from being, you know, either celebratory or reformatory to being transformative? And I thought, again, perhaps by looking at um, what, what, what Nadine's called economy, but I would say, again, those three issues that you've identified have obviously merged because they relate so particularly to issues of power and, and interest. 
and um, and you know the, the the violence issue kind of cuts across them as you know, the violence is as much in people's homes as in their workplaces, etc. Um, but actually, to try, I think that begins to explain some of those relationships. That even though those men are unemployed in these focus groups, they haven't got le local leadership positions. They actually um, have certain other powers in domestic relations, patriarchal powers that cut across um, economic powers or maybe different to, to economic powers. And then practically I was just wondering with um, local government elections kind of looming, um, if this wasn't an opportunity to take your activated <laughs> um, group um, and to see what those points of formal engagement might be. Um, you know, because obviously there are ex there's extreme alienation there, but to actually see with collective action, with um, sharing of um, what, what new alternative imaginings might be, what alternative futures might be, there might be um, something in that that you could sort of tangibly take this forward with, um, without hopefully compromising its very alternative um, makeup. Thank you very much. Should we get a few more comments and then and then we'll just get you to pull them all together, hopefully. Yes. Um, I just had a question from the beginning that you were commenting on how uh, on the baseline uh, you discovered that the government information was condescending and disconnected from, from uh, women's life and just from um, just my interest coming on from public policy and what governments do, it's, it would just be interesting to see for you to like elaborate on uh, what did this mean and um, coming from also that uh, critique of uh, not being this uh, liberal vision of participation, how would you imagine a government doing What's in the realm of the of the local government to do regarding the information they they share with women, and what changes you would imagine or which ones you would? Can we just get the last one? I think it will have to be. Sorry. Um, yeah. So just a couple of uh, points. One is, you know, I think the most uh, important one. So let me claim that that is. Uh, you know, while watching the film and uh, reading the report and so on, I've been recently reading quite a bit on, uh, you know, sort of breaking open the stereotypes around women and violence, um, but particularly in the sort of peace and security sphere, there's been a lot of work re-examining women's roles actually in violence. Uh, the uh, whole stereotype of women as victims. So, so that's it was kind of triggered by this uh, the points you made around that, around the stereotypes about women as victims of violence and the women doom scenario. But I'm wondering whether also there's potential, particularly because um, this is so focused on young people and young women, uh, to really begin to also examine and interrogate one's role in perpetuation of violence in sometimes very uh, subversive ways, not necessarily explicit ways. And I wanted to offer to share a couple of really excellent pieces that I've read recently on that. For instance, looking at the Rwandan genocide and looking at the role of women in the, in the Rwandan genocide as leaders of genocide, you know. So when we're talking about the stereotyping and, you know, having the, the sort of deeper levels of interrogation that can be built on this foundation that you've created, um, since it's framed especially around the question of uh, governance and participation in that, and what I read and hear from South African friends and colleagues is the increasing polarization, for instance, along ethnic lines. Um, 
attempts, rather, to polarize around ethnic lines. And that is clearly targeting young people, you know, using young people as the sort of stormtroopers in, in, in these sort of attacks and so on. So I think there is a sort of historic moment where you're poised um, as a society and politically, I think it's a political moment, where it's on the threshold of a lot of uh, forms of polarization and fragmentation that are very violent and have the potential for violence. So I think it's really important to uh, put this on the agenda for the longer term process of really also getting young women to engage with women's roles in violence in a more complicated way. Thank you for that. Can we get your responses? Okay. Um, I would like to, um, to start with, thank you for uh, everyone for the comment. Um, Kathleen, you, you mentioned something about um, the youth generally being restless, but at the same time, uh, restless and they are also familiarized with uh, ICT, but they want, there is a little bit more of, of um, non participation. And the example was on the voting. And I think uh, we didn't manage to insert it in the movie, but what we did was um, not after every discussion we have, like you saw in the documentary, and then there will be an action that needs to be done. And then, for example, for the voting, uh, we, we, the young woman came up with um, a photo voice campaign where everybody writes about the, uh, the, the title is, uh, is voting right or duty, and then they kind of communicate about why they don't feel like uh, voting or why do they vote or to whom they vote. And then that was uh, uh, distributed on Facebook, and then it generated a lot of awareness and debates and those kind of things. So somehow, um, in terms of visibility, I think um, we don't see them, or we didn't get to see them as um, EAF because of you know the online participation part. But I think they did it what they can. And also in terms of in, in, in involving way to go, involving the local municipality in this kind of uh, activist work. Um, most of the time, we try to in every function we try to in, uh, you know communicate and invite them, and obviously we always not get to that. But uh, we also redirected that and then we, I don't know if you watched it on the big debate uh, during the election, young women govern South Africa, uh, the participants were there also voicing their political concern. So in many ways I think um, why, why am I giving you these examples is that we kind of try to negotiate between spaces. It's not easy and then when we can't pass that then we create another way of voicing our concern and everyday struggle. Um, and Nandine, I, I accept uh, the comments that you gave. And like this, you say, it's a, almost a, pro it's a process, but I think I will take that as a comment. And Alison, I think um, about the background, uh, forming a background about existing information, um, particularly the mix it, it has been explained in detail on the contextual analysis. Mm -hmm. And on the Facebook part, I, I think um, we have to put it back also. But we were told uh, on the data analysis it will come up, of course. Um, but yeah, you're right, mm -hmm. we have to do that also. Um, what else is there? Yeah, I'm not sorry. Okay, I think maybe I should be brief. Just in response to yours, we took our cue from the quantitative study where uh, young women were saying things like they had no idea whether uh, the community could uh, monitor um, local government processes, mm -hmm. or the kind of information that one should. So we followed that up with focus group discussions and had also in our very often weekly meetings and realized that there was actually no knowledge of some really basic information. So it's in that sense of alienation and afterwards realized that there's a deep um, discomfort with the information that is there. They found it legalistic, technical, and just didn't want to engage. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, yeah, that was one thing. And the other thing that you mentioned, how do we, how are we preparing them in a sense? Actually, that wasn't our role. That's not what we, in many ways, we saw that, and I take your point, well, you know, it's almost unfair to conscientize um, and, and create a sort of comfort zone for young women and then sort of say, well, go out and be activists. But it's, there are limits, I think, to what one can do. In many ways, it's up to particular women to decide where they want to take their political energies to. Some might wish to um, follow the sort of more you know, rights activist route. Some might want to do something quite different. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question. But I think it's related to your comment. In many ways, one of the challenges was to try and get young women to understand because South African politics is very issue driven. Um, mm -hmm. You know, all the NGOs, that's what people do. You work on health, you work on education, HIV. and I think, or HIV. And I think many young people, and many people, many South Africans, are really tired of it because they know that there are connections. There's an obvious connection between, for example, transport and unemployment and violence. And the reason why we came up with these things, and we talk about this in the report, is the sense of things being connected. So I think the whole process of encouraging um, the group to become critical, active thinkers, to be able to criticize, to be able to think things through, um, has been really important. Because so often there's this assumption that you train people to be active simply by focusing on health, you know, everything about health, rather than you think holistically and critically about how things come together, class, gender, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, Thanks very much for that, um, Deirdre. Um, Deirdre, just in relation to your last point, I'm sorry because I should be closing this session. But um, I, I suppose for those of us who haven't had an opportunity to look at the paper, mm -hmm. there's um, some kind of sense of this is fabulous um, gender um, work, um, you know, um, making people aware of all sorts of things, that's great. Um, but what is the link to ICT? So that, um, you know, in terms of the um, one of the rationales for the project about how ICTs could be used um, in an emancipatory way um, for women, etc. Um, and, and so the, the only other point I wanted to make, other than trying to think how you might um, use them in, to engage with formal processes, yeah. um, is also that there are, you know, um, I think in the East Gate, that I mean, one doesn't want to sound sort of terribly sort of technology shawal solutions, but there are really interesting um, apps development groups working with community-initiated projects. So they, for example, not waiting for e-government services, but setting up their own apps around informing government when there are water leakages or sewage problems or whatever. And you know, this Lungisa, they call they've got, you know set up this um, a, th a thing which government, fortunately, in the Western Cape responded to, and there's now a Greenland 48 hour turnaround. And because it is responded to, it's quite effective. And so um, I think, just again, possibly in terms of sharing the capital, just making people aware, not everybody in that group is going to want to go and develop an app or yeah. work with somebody on developing an app or something like yeah. that. But just linking up these disparate projects that are broadly committed to, I mean, they're called open democracy. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, you make the last point. Uh, I'll just place. very briefly. <laughs> I, 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 I watched the movie and, and read the report with a lot of interest. Um, mm. I would have really liked to have seen in the report more background and uh, kind of description of who was doing what and what was done and, and uh, um, sort of give it a context that would be more meaningful to somebody who isn't familiar with the, the specifics on the ground.